Hi, guys. <laughs> so those of you who know me, which is most of you, well, most of you know me and from the Russia context, um, some of this actually might be a repeat because I did this project in the fall. Um, but I just wanted to go over just a few of the... Um, so I'll start with a bit of a background about the sailor sucker, mostly for those that aren't familiar with that fish or why it's on the radar for conservation work at Arasha. Uh, I'll go over the purpose of the study that we've done, which is called the mark recapture. If you've all also probably heard that rolling around a lot this uh, this spring, the methods that we used to conduct the study, um, some really interesting findings that we got by the end of it, and the, some conclusions. And I will end with a bit of a reflection. It won't all be science. <laughs> um, so to introduce you guys, those of you who haven't um, been introduced, the sailor sucker is um, well. It's a sucker, so it feeds on the bottom of the stream, and it has this sort of small. Um, subterminal mouth with fleshy lips, um, and that's how, yeah, that's how it subsists. I guess you could say. Um, they can grow up to 25 centimeters at kind of the longest that they come. And this one actually, we caught this field season. Um, this is a female that's about 25 centimeters. She's um, pretty ripe and ready to lay her eggs. So that was a really interesting fish to catch because I'd never seen them that that big. I, I knew they could get that big. Um, this is a male up here. You can see by uh, the shape of the anal fin. It's kind of when it fans out. You'll see later as well um, some better pictures of that. And we've got a juvenile here. Um, and you'll also notice this really dark red band across the side. That's um, a characteristic during the breeding season. And it's more prominent in males than females, as you can see here as well. Um, so they're a member. Oh, they reach sexual maturity around their second year, and they can live up to about five years. Uh, and they're a member of the Catastomidae family, so there's also a species of long nose sucker that's closely related, but they are evolutionarily distinct and reproduct reproductively isolated, which is kind of just a fancy way of saying that at some point they're, they were geographically um, isolated by mountains and other um, features such as ice sheets. So this is just kind of a brief history of... Um, the, I guess, the ancestor of what we have now as a sailor sucker would have originated just south. So this is here, we've got this big ice sheet here. This is the Puget Lobe, the kind of southernmost point. They started, um, I guess they would have existed mostly here between that southernmost point and the Columbia River, um, according to what, we've, what we know about them. And as this, um, as this ice began to recede uh, up north, they started to colonate some of these more, uh, well, where, the, where it was ice covered at, at that point. So um, you can see here, northwestern Washington and southwestern BC, this is really the only place on earth that this species is found. The reason why I'm showing you this is because um, this species is at risk, as you've probably heard that thrown around as well. So there are four watersheds in northwestern Washington where this, this specific species of sucker is found, and then 11 in BC, and they're all kind of laid out here. As you can see, number one here, that's the Little Camel River uh, watershed, and that's where we've been working. So globally, very small distribution, um, which is part of why they're um, at risk, and also to do with the threats to their, their habitat, because you can see those areas are uh, quite urbanized. Um, so they're, they're recognized by almost every, well, every level of, of government. So provincially, they're red listed as a priority one species. Um, COSIWIC isn't is non-governmental, but it's a committee on the status of endangered wildlife in Canada, and they've listed them as threatened Federally, under the Species at Risk Act, they're endangered, and IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, has listed them as uh, G1, so Global Priority 1, I guess. Um, so this is what the uh, federal um, recovery strategy looks like, and that's mostly been compiled by a biologist, a local expert on sailor suckers, Mike Pearson, who's been a big part of this project as well. Um, so when I'm talking about kind of painting this picture of why why do, why do we study or why do we protect species at risk, especially the sailor sucker? Um, it's kind of indispensable, and we think of, when we think about value, a lot of times with um, natural resources or even wildlife, we think commercial value and other things like that, recreational value, whatever. Um, but I like to think about the intrinsic value because, well, and that meaning like value in itself or for its own sake, in its own right. Um, this quote, I think, just really sums it up well, so I'll read it because I think it's, it's one that I've... Um, yeah, I've really been pondering since my time in Russia, so I'll read it up. Um, the last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. 
Uh, I just like how it speaks to this like interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. Um, and you guys might have seen that from the last time I presented, but I really like that quote. So, um, so I'm not going to assume that everyone knows, again, the history of why, um, why we're looking at sailor suckers um, as, as a Russia, Canada. And uh, so I'll just briefly mention that it was back in the 70s, it was thought to be completely extirpated, so locally extinct from this watershed. And it wasn't until 2011 when one of our interns, Audrey, as you most, most of you know, found one in the pond here, right on, on site at Brooksdale. And um, since then, we've been serving the entire watershed, we as Arasha, um, to see where they are. So this has mostly been looking at their distribution, not necessarily, um, not necessarily like an, an intense um, population survey, but just to see where they are and. As you can see here, a lot of the ones we've found have been in this area, which is Campbell Valley Regional Park, and this area just south of Langley Municipal Nature Park, which is actually private property, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but this gives you an idea of the scope. Um, we've got, yeah, White Rock over here, and most of you know we are Brooksdale right, right, right here, I think. That's right. So since 2011, 2011 to 2016, we've caught 39 suckers. Um, 15 of those were caught in the fall uh, of 20, or sorry, in 2016, 11 of them in the fall. Uh, and that's the project I was a part of. So it's been fun to kind of see this project through a little bit farther to the next sort of level. Um, and as I said, Mike Pearson um, has been working with us and he was the one who, after finding the ones we did in the fall, recommended or suggested that we look into doing a mark recapture, um, which I'll get into the details, the kind of the written uh, of it, I guess. But... Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just exciting to be able to move forward to another level. So this um, just goes to show this, the two sites we chose for the mark recapture. Um, so we set traps in both of these locations, and the green just is there to show that that's the color we use to mark the fish um, in those locations. So, um, so that we could see maybe if they're traveling between sites. Uh, and again, I'll get into that in a little bit, but those are the two sites that we chose. Um, this is kind of how it goes. That's what the traps look like. They get thrown in the back of the van or in the truck. Um, and we load them on kayaks or canoes, and we get them out into the river. Sometimes we just walk with them. But we set them about 50 meters apart. Um, we try to find the deep, um, slow-moving areas of the, of the river, kind of slack water, back eddies, um, because that's where the fish are going to be. They're bottom feeders, and they want to expend minimal energy to stick down in the low spot. So that's where we tend to set the traps. Um, and we usually set them ideally tw less than 24 hours, so we set them in the afternoon and pull them in the morning. Um, this, this spring we set a total of 181 traps, which is a, it's a lot. <laughs> I was a little intimidated actually because last term we were setting like maybe seven in, in a day, and this, ter this term it was 25. Every day we were setting 25 and pulling 25 traps. So this is kind of what the timeline looked like. So we did five days solid of setting and pulling and setting and pulling, and then we waited a week in which we were doing amphibian surveys and other things and staying busy, and then we um, did a recapture week. So um, the first week we were marking the fish we caught, then the second week we were getting to see which ones we had already marked from the first week and which ones were new individuals unmarked, and that's a bit of how we came up with the estimate, and again, I'll get into a little bit more of that. Um, we also ID'd the other fish we caught in the traps. We actually catch a lot of other things, which is interesting. So I thought I'd let you guys see a little bit more because it's not just the sailor sucker. In fact, most of the time it isn't the sailor sucker, <laughs> which is sad. But um, we catch some amphibians. So we've got the uh, northwestern salamander here. We also catch um, rough skin newts, which are really cool if you've seen them. Um, there's a flathead minnow there. Of course it does. Um, stickleback, catch a lot of those. And we catch salmonids as well, so we've got a rainbow trout here and a coho fry, and so it's fun, it's fun to see what else is in the river. And we, we take that down, we, we record those, so you know, maybe someday that data is actually going to be really important because those species are doing fine now, and some of them are introduced and invasive, so it's interesting, you know, that data we get to collect uh, on the side as well. So when we find sailor suckers, um, this process kind of goes something like this. So they, um, we anesthetize them with a solution of clove oil, then we mark them. So here is a picture, close up here, of the syringe with some dye in it. And it's, it's um, technically called a sub, subcutaneous elastomer injection. So it just goes just, just right under the, the skin there. The fish is on its back, if you can kind of imagine there. Um, and the dye just goes right in above like the top of that, where the fin uh, comes out. And it's, it's pretty easy to see. And these marks um, are semi-permanent, which 
in some cases means we can actually see them after a couple of years still. So I think that's going to be really cool in the future to see um, as we're catching them in different areas, which ones are marked and which, with which colors as well. Um, that would give us a really um, much more insight into how the fish move around and how they're doing. Um, they're not obviously marked individually, but it's just, um, it'll be just like from where they, where they were when we marked them, I guess. Um, and also in what week, because we have different marks for the both, both weeks. Um, and I'll just show you a quick video here. Um, gives you a little bit more. Um, kind of cool. I'll have to turn that on again. Excuse the Alltech Lansing Powering advertisement. On. Welcome to Alltech Lansing. Uh, hopefully it works. <laughs> oh, is that? No. Is it playing out of? It's playing from the projector. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just enjoy it. So the fish is just kind of sleeping. It's sedated. <laughs> no. Super slow. You can see there. The green dye right there. Right there. You guys can maybe see it? I don't know. But. Yeah, 10. 153, and he's a male because of this anal fin here, his nice fan shape. If you can, you guys can hear it, I'm just pointing out that he's a male. And then we just give him some time in the fresh water again before, I, when we notice that they're really coming back, then we'll let them go. It's not really fair to drop them in while they're kind of like, which way is up? So, um, but yeah, they, it doesn't take long, so it's, it's, uh, oops. It was really fun to handle the fish um, so much. I honestly, didn't know much about fish before doing this kind of work and also didn't um, really know that I would develop such a soft spot in my heart for, for fish. So we'll see where that takes me, I guess. Um, right. So there's those photos there, marking, uh, measuring them. So we, yeah, we beat some records this, this spring. It was exciting. Before this spring, um, we had caught seven suckers in one trap, and that was a big thing. It was like, wow, seven in one trap. Well, this term, we caught 11 in one trap. It was funny because it kind of went up. It was like, oh, man, we got eight. This is huge. It's a new record. We got nine. Oh, 11. It's like so great. Um, so I'm really excited about my, my suckers. <laughs> so we set a, a total of 181 traps, 10 days, 10 long days in the field, um, we caught a total of 110 suckers this term. This is not including the 38, uh, 39 from before, so it's exciting. Um, 92 of them were male and 16 females, so a lot more males. I don't know if that's because the females evade traps or whatever, or maybe there's just really less of them. Um, but we treated them very carefully, especially the ones that were ready to lay eggs. We were like, I, some of them actually didn't, we didn't process at all because we were like, you know what? <laughs> Red listed species ready to lay their eggs. Let's just leave them, <laughs> leave them to do that. Two of them were unknown if you're doing the math there. Um, and then 86 were unmarked. So I, I, I added that in there just so that um, I could clarify that the, the other 24 individuals, they would have been trapped twice at some point. Um, so because we had been marking them, we could tell, oh, we've caught that one already. So, um, so 86 of them were, that's how many we caught. Unique, Unique individuals, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, so some other interesting findings. So if you can picture back to the um, big overall site map. Um, the, so this is the Le, Le Bounty Farm. So this is just south of uh, the Langley Municipal Nature Park. And this is the stretch here. It's hard to see the river. I could have drawn it on, but it kind of goes like this in a big B. And a lot of the suckers we caught were in this stretch, surprisingly, because it doesn't look like the best habitat. It's kind of, um, well... Manicured, yeah, it's more exposed, yeah. Um, and so the cool thing was that, um, well, there's these two ponds here. We didn't end up putting a trap in this one, but we did in this one. And these ponds are connected to the river at some points during the year, but not the entire year. Those um, little connection points end up drying up in the summer. And the river does get quite a lot lower, um, which makes distribution um, challenging, obviously, for the fish. But... Um, this was, this was neat because we actually ended up catching four suckers in this pond the last day of pulling all of the traps. So this tells us that obviously they get through that little connection and potentially they spend some time sort of in refuge there um, at times of low water or, um, or potentially 
when we thought they were completely extirpated, maybe it's ponds like this that they were actually sort of hiding out in. Um, they do tend to be tolerant of lower oxygen as well, so these ponds don't tend to have much else um, other than some invasive species, but um, the suckers were there, so that was, that was neat. Um, perhaps a future research question for future interns as well, because there's lots, there's lots more to learn. So I'm excited to pass on the torch, I guess. Um, another thing that I, or another question that I think wasn't like completely adequately answered during this survey, but I think would be really interesting to look at, um, is the question of sort of where are the where are the bar barriers or where are the obstacles for suckers to travel throughout the watershed? So going back to this site, this huge site map, um, we on the last day again on, on the second week of of uh, the recapture week, um, we actually caught two fish that were marked pink from this area um, down in the Camel Valley Park. So that was like a huge thing. We were like, what is that really, like, could that really be? Um, but so that's like, a, it's almost seven kilometers between the, those two. It's downstream, so maybe it's a fun float, I don't know. But um, obviously there's, there's some areas that they were getting through. So how, how, how those obstacles, um, where they are, if they are, um, if they're only there parts of the year, it'd be really interesting to actually do a, a survey through the main stem that, that looks at those. Um, I know some of the areas are, I know from experience, they're quite impassable, um, whether that's to do with water levels or just the vegetation that's there. Um, but it would be, it'd be really interesting to look at. So this tells us that they are traveling much farther, th much farther than we ever thought. Because I think before that, my kids said like a couple of kilometers at ma like max that they would travel maybe in a, like in a, in a season or a year. So this is in two, two-ish weeks, two and a half weeks that we caught one that we had caught here and we caught it down here. So pretty cool. <laughs> pretty exciting. That's my little arrow. Um, so this is, it, it's, it gets a little bit more technical in here, um, but the, the, the formula that we use is called the Peterson estimate. So um, basically this is just a relatively simple um, method of coming up with a an estimate of the population size. Uh, and I just want to clarify too that this isn't an estimate for the entire watershed, but rather just those two sites. So I did it separately for the two sites. I actually did one as well for, for all of the suckers we caught, considering that sort of a reach if they are connected, um, which it seems they are. Um, and so here we have, so these, these variables, um, I'll just rattle them off quickly, but basically the M stands for the marked individuals that released the first week. The C is for the total number of captured individuals the second week, and then the R is for the number of individuals recaptured in the second week. So it might seem a bit complicated, but once you put the numbers in, we came up with an estimate of 42. So in the Camel Valley Park, we caught 20 individuals. So based on this estimate or this um, formula, there, we can kind of infer that there's more, obviously, than that, and potentially around 42, estimating. Um, and at the Le Bounty Farm, we caught 90 fish there. So obviously this is going to be a lot larger, but once we put in the numbers again, we came up with 172. So the two together separately um, are 213 fish, but when I did the, when I did the estimate for both, both of them as one, um, as one population, I came up with 231. So we're looking at a lot more than we thought. That's basically what we found, which is potentially not as surprising as I had initially thought, just because, because of the way that we had surveyed. Um, Imagine that sort of watershed map again. When we were doing the surveys for the past six years, we were really looking throughout the whole watershed and definitely trapping in areas that weren't suitable habitat really for suckers either, but really just curious where they were. Um, so naturally, there were years that we didn't catch any uh, and some years where we caught a few, but then we didn't go back and trap day after day after day in that spot. So maybe there were similar numbers. I don't know. We, we, didn't, we didn't, can't go back in time. But now we're seeing that if we know where they are and we trap a bunch, there's actually a lot of individuals that, um, yeah, we caught a lot of unmarked fish. And so that was really exciting week or day after day to be like, oh man, there's so many unmarked fish in here. This is great. There's so many. Um, so yeah, what was that? Yeah, 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 it's true. Well, yeah, for the, yeah, for the estimate, yeah. So, as a, in conclusion, we came up with an estimate of the population. Um, we see that they're potentially moving farther than we thought. 
Um, and it would be really neat to see, uh, to do some mark recapture studies in different reaches. So we have caught them in some spots in kind of spots in the upper watershed and some closer to Kingfisher Farm. So again, we've only caught a few there, but who's to, like, who's to say there isn't, you know, a dozen more, a few dozen more. Um, and then I, again, like I mentioned before, it'd be really neat to, to really do a, um, a closer look at where, how these populations might be separate or if they are. Um, yeah, how do we define those sort of reaches and, and things like that? And then, and then looking again over the years as we catch them in different areas, um, potentially seeing how far, like the where where the marked ones are. Um, I'm curious to see how long the marks will last as well. So the, you actually use, you can use a UV light, um, which helps to see them. They're really visible now, but over time the UV light will help um, to see them as well. So in an attempt to do a bit of a reflection. <laughs> Um, I, I really, really appreciated the opportunity. Um, I won't really speak to like my whole Arasha experience cause there'd be so much to say, but, um, especially doing this market capture study, it was, it was really intense. It was overwhelming at times, but, um, I, I gained, like I learned, I learned so much. I wanted to like write down, I, I was thinking in my head, there must be like 70 lessons that I could write down that I learned, um, really useful, practical field skills. Um, even talking to the technician that we were working with, she was like, wow, I don't know if there's really any other internships that would allow you this type of experience, like super hands-on, and you're kind of like in the driver's seat in some ways of like making these decisions and organizing the data and preparing and communicating and all of these things. Um, and it was also really important for me to consider the, the importance of adapting and not sweat, like not sweating the small things as well. Um, there were some things that weren't quite so small that I definitely was really stressed about, including some of you might have, might have uh, recalled that we were, we were um, kind of miss, uh, what's the word? Well, some of the traps were kind of missing, <laughs> let's just say. <laughs> um, high water uh, events and tying, tying them off to things that weren't stable, different things like that. We, we lost track of a few traps, and that was really stressful because obviously there's red listed fish in those traps and if you leave them too many nights I was like having nightmares of catching uh, like no not quite but it was it was just it was a really really um it was a really amazing experience for sure uh and I just really felt as well that through that time I really felt God's grace because and not just like okay I know that God has grace for all of this but it was like practically through the people I was working with just the patience um and the grace and the um just like the steadiness, I guess, of the people around me throughout that, even though I was feeling like quite up and down at times and quite overwhelmed sometimes as well. Those of you who worked with me would, <laughs> would remember kind of those um, emotions. Um, but I was also able to see God in, in everything and take those moments like we've really been practicing sort of recollection of the soul. And that was really important for me because I tend to be pretty task driven. So between tasks, being able to take those moments to recollect um, and to return to him and to see like in the beauty of the day, like the where, I mean, Caleb mentioned it, canoeing and like doing this work. Oh, it was just, it was amazing. And like when the sun would come out, it would just be like 10 times better, but even still it was just beautiful and really fun and, um, and really rewarding, really rewarding. So yeah, I want to thank everyone who was working with me and, and I, I really want to thank them even, it, even by name. So Mike Pearson, obviously um, huge part of this, Pe uh, Petra, his technician, Christy Juto spent two days, two full days in the field with us, amazing, <laughs> we loved having her, um, Andrew Bayless as well, Caleb Gake, of course, um, Melanie Moore, a, a special thanks to Melanie Moore, past intern who you know, she came out like five, I think five at least, full days with me um, and others to help with this project and seriously couldn't, could not have done this amount of work without the volunteers. Chloe Buckwalter also helped, um, Lainey Fung, another past intern, and of course Dan Olson helped out, which was really fun. <laughs> so, um, hi Dwayne. So that, that is, yeah. Oh, that's my victory pose. I have to stop on that picture for a second. Um, felt really good to finish that whole field season, but also it's very bittersweet because I love the field work. Um, and, and who knows? <laughs> who knows if I'll be back? <laughs>